my name is Tim Shriver. I want to start by saying that in um, 34 years of professional life, I have never attended a professional gathering that has this level of representation from people with intellectual differences. And, uh, and that goes for a lot of gatherings, except for those that are explicitly organized for that purpose. So this is the most inclusive gathering of people with intellectual differences in my lifetime. And I want to thank Kim and Synergos and the team for being so open to having the presence of this kind of diversity in the room. There's all kinds of diversity. Not one is better than the other, but this one is almost never in the room. And it is here. So I just want to uh, recognize that and applaud it and be grateful for it. Um, we're coming at the end of lots of panels and discussions. So we had our pre-brief. And here's what we decided that I would say. Each of these four people are experts, uh, leaders, and global figures. Each of them has a story that includes experiences of profound isolation, uh, incredible grit and courage and determination, uh, applying that grit to making a difference, and finding themselves included and on a team. And none of them are going to tell those stories. So you just, got, <laughs> you just got the summary of the line of change that each of them has experienced. Uh, we decided not because their stories aren't important, but because we felt like we're maybe at a pivot point in this meeting where we want to shift a little bit from narrative to solution, a little bit from personal to collective, a little bit from uh, one's own experience to the implications for a collective action. And so we've challenged ourselves just recently over lunch to think how could we run this panel in a way that would do that as opposed to telling uh, necessarily just our stories. So um, uh, Loretta, uh, I, I, again, I won't introduce everybody except to say that there's something distinctive about each person here. Um, uh, Matthew is the first person in history to have an intellectual challenge and commit himself to being a, prof a professional personal trainer for people with intellectual differences. To our knowledge, no such human being exists anywhere on the planet. So that's one of his distinctive qualities. Shanta is the first person to bring the idea of disability rights to the field of human rights, Human Rights Watch, and to bring that as a brand new position within the global human rights community, that the disability rights community belongs there now and forever. The first person to do that. Loretta, as you may have heard, uh, grew up one of many siblings, a person with an intellectual difference, uh, and yet is the first person in her family ever to own a home and to own her own home. And Nuruddin is the first person in, as he would say, Palestinian Jerusalem to create an inclusive school. So you have here people who have extraordinary distinctions in powerful and personal and meaningful ways that they'll share with you. The challenge that we've given to them and that we're going to give to you and your tables is this. Loretta said there was a time when Martin Luther King gave his I have a dream speech and the world pivoted. Um, uh, the world changed. So when we get to the breakouts, uh, we're going to ask you at your tables to shape your own I have a dream speeches and to focus not just on the destination, but on what you would do to get there. And so we've asked, uh, I'm going to ask our panel to, to speak briefly, each of them, uh, and to echo uh, the words of Dr. King. Uh, each of them refuses to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. Each of them believes in the fierce urgency of now. Each of them knows that we cannot walk alone. Each of them is convinced that we will not wallow in the valley of despair. And each of them has a dream. With that, I will start with Nuruddin. OK, thank you. Sorry. No, that's OK. No. I, I just changed it. I was, OK. Are you OK with starting? We had a batting order, and I just messed it up. Okay. Are you OK with starting, Nuruddin, or would you like Matthew to start? You start. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, from isolation to social inclusion, um, 
uh, me personally, I lived a life of isolation for many years. And then uh, I started to think about how to uh, overcome that isolation and uh, uh, get connected to society, to people and to community. And I started from education, as I believe that education is a powerful and good platform and vehicle that can connect me to uh, uh, people and that can help many others like me to be connected to community members and to the uh, 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 peers, to their peers in the society. Uh, so education can be used uh, as a place and in a pluralistic environment uh, that bring together people with different disabilities, with different um, uh, problems, and a, 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 in an environment that uh, fosters the sense of understanding, fosters the sense of mutual respect, the sense of reciprocity, uh, and through education we could generate new people with new thoughts and education can have a very posit positive impact on the lives of special needs and isolated, as, an, as isolated persons who suffered a lot from that uh, 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 condition that they used to live in. Because it will have as well a positive Im impact on the families and the attitudes of people and their perspectives of people in the community uh, uh, as you, through education, you could uh, generate new generations, new people with new thoughts and ideas and attitudes, and you could change the neg negative perspectives of those people towards uh, people with dis disabilities in general. And, uh, and of course, uh, such a strategy should be also uh, accompanied or go side by side with changing policy because if you uh, launch such a project or if you launch such a strategy in a community and the strategy is still um, uh, encounters some policy uh, problems or some policy uh, rules that prevent it from being implemented then it would not be uh, successful in the uh, way that you need it. Uh, so there should be concentration on uh, different uh, dimensions uh, that will bring about the solution to such a problem, including the policy change, the educational strategies, the perspective of people, and uh, that could be also achieved through awareness campaigns uh, in the community uh, to change uh, the way people uh, deal with or look uh, to, to, to those people who are isolated or who, the, who are eliminated uh, or those uh, people whose role is uh, simply eliminated and they are excluded from, uh, from life. Um, as we said here today and yesterday, uh, isolation has many dangerous outcomes and many negative impacts on the lives of people in the community um, as this could uh, uh, bring about hatred, let's say, or bring about uh, lack of trust between people and conflict at all levels uh, in the community and it hinders the development of communities and the social advancement. Uh, so each one of us, each one of you and everybody in the community can be an ambassador for change, for getting away and uh, releasing people from that isolation and help people to be connected uh, with each other and to, uh, you could think about 
you could think about the, 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 the potential, the great potential and the great positive, um, uh, positive values that those isolated persons have and possess and that would contribute to the, to the uh, community development if they are given the opportunity to do that. Thank you, Nardine. Thank you. So, education, public awareness, policy change, and attitude change. Uh, a good mandate. Just keep in mind, you are going to get your time. Okay. I, I'm talking to the audience now. And you're going to be asked to report out. So be thinking on your own I have a dream speeches. Let's go next to Matthew, shall we? Uh, my dream is for... Um, everyone, uh, not just people with disabilities, but everyone in society to feel valued. Um, and to know that uh, different doesn't have to be a negative thing, it can be a positive thing, an advantage for us to move forward in the world. Uh, I think in society, we're told we have to act a certain way, talk a certain way, do this, do that. You can't do it that way, that's not correct. I think we gotta get away from that and look at being different as a skill. I think if we were all the same, life would be boring, you know, it's unique. And in this room, you know, I've heard amazing stories from people from South Africa, from uh, everywhere around the world, and everyone's different, and that is so exciting. So I think we got to embrace that as society and look how can we use that to move forward um, and make this world a better place. Uh, I think how we got to get people to realize that it is okay to be different is we got to get it in a curriculum setting um, early in education. I don't think we should be waiting till people are in their 20s, 30s, and, and then finding out you know, about these different problems and people with disabilities and their challenges. I think if we can get it early in the school system, I think it will be a positive change. Uh, and I think we also got to look at uh, team involvement, and I, I don't mean team just from being on a sports team. I think, you know, in school you can be on a chess team, a debate team. Uh, there's so many ways you can be involved as a team. And I think if uh, we all bound together um, as an inclusive team, integrating people both with disabilities and people without, I think we can really create a positive change. And my favorite thing when I hear the word team, uh, if we do it together, everyone will achieve more. Well done. Thank you, Matthew. Shanta, are you ready? I'm regretting offering to go after Matthew now, right? <laughs> <laughs> really. Um, well, uh, thank you, Tim, for your very kind introduction. I must say that um, I'm very fortunate to be the first person to work on disability rights, but it was really um, the result of a lot of advocates, including some people in the room and people with disabilities like those, like Matthew, who really pushed our organization, Human Rights Watch, to, to see this issue as a, an important human rights issue that we need to be really addressing. So I, I want to give credit to that. Um, I, I wanted to raise two points. Uh, <clears throat> two sort of strategies. Um, Tim challenged us at lunchtime to, and we all had to rewrite our, our little presentations, um, to think about you know, how, how, let's take the next step forward. How would we move from the, these feelings of isolation toward uh, having a greater sense of community and connectedness? And I was thinking about this and had sort of two, two thoughts to share. One is, I think, the idea of partnerships. Uh, and how, you know, this, uh, even just listening to the go-go uh, grannies uh, about the partnership um, between the government, the communities, the families, the children, and how that is so critical to engaging and connecting. And um, I wanted to share an example uh, from our work in, in Croatia. So people with both intellectual and mental disabilities, um, in, as in many countries, are often locked up in institutions, isolated and segregated from their communities, from their families, oftentimes uh, since birth. And so um, what's interesting in Croatia is they decided actually to really step up their efforts and begin moving people out of these institutions and into um, their own apartments in the community as in other countries like in the United States and in Canada and even other countries around the world. 
Um, and so we've been following this process in Croatia and um, what it's meant to the people who've been through this process. Uh, and you know, I, um, I'm honored to be able to share their voices here um, is, is freedom. Uh, one woman we met who was, whose name is Jelica, she's 58 years old and she lived in, in an institution for the last 17 years. And she told us, I felt like I was in prison, like I was being punished in some way. And now I regained my dignity. I feel like a human being. And that's what I think the, the partnership in Croatia between the government and communities uh, is really moving people. And we ha Matthew and I had a really lovely discussion during our dialogue walk today about the fact, you know, in, to his point, that everyone is human and they need to be, they need to feel as if they're part of the, of our, of our human diversity. And the other point I wanted to make was about um, listening and uh, how that is a strategy. And it's something that um, I, we've tried to, you know, we've, I've learned a lot, including from Diane, who's here from Inclusion International, about the importance of listening and um, consulting with the populations whom you want to benefit, um, whom you're working with, and how that consultation and that listening um, helps develop programs and policies and systems that are tailored to what they need and what they want. And I think in the case of people with mental or intellectual disabilities, there's often the sense of we know what you want, we know what's best for you. And so whether that's family members or whether that's schools or whether that's governments are often making those decisions for them or doctors. Uh, but instead, by engaging and consulting with um, people, then it would help go a long way in addressing the isolation that they experience uh, and bringing them more into the community. Thank you. Uh, Tim, I have to say, how do you know where you're going if you don't know where you come from? If you listen to the people of the day, you heard about the indigenous people and their history. Well, I'm going to take you a little bit back on my history. My mother when she had us. I could tell my mother was very depressed, but she always, she had this big heart, and yes, she was a big woman. Uh, we followed under her, but I can remember the time when my mother passed away. She was very depressed, and you know what happens when you get depressed, and you feel isolated. It's not good, because from depression and isolation comes the danger of other consequences. And then when she had me, she knew it was gonna be a long road. And of course, I was isolated. I didn't know what depression meant as a child. But just seeing my life as I went through, did I have a dream? Did I have anything to look forward to? And if you looked at society, I was supposed to be one of those people who were supposed to be institutionalized. But as time went by, my mother's dream was for her daughter to graduate from high school and not just hand it a piece of paper and say she's attended. I completed my studies just like my other sisters and brothers. That was my mother's dream. But I had dreams too, I wanted to give back. Could I give back as a person with intellectual disability? Because society viewed us as nobodies, not even supposed to live here. Would I have that opportunity? I had things against me, color of my skin, being a woman, and being a woman with an intellectual disability were all no-nos, that wasn't gonna happen until I met some people along the way. People outside of my community. At the time, our country was in the strife of blacks and whites not even getting along. It was a little white lady that took me and showed me how to knit on two pencils. It was another woman that showed me how to count money. It was a man. And then the third woman became an advocate for me and she taught me how to go forward and not look at what isolated me and what depressed me. And what the most I got from her was no money involved. It wasn't the way I lived. It wasn't because I was poor. But what I got from her when I seen her actions, that she was able to give back. And I admired how she was able to go to the community, even though it wasn't her community, and make meals to help her church. And I would look and say, Miss Janet, can I help do that? 
it was that person who made a difference. And now, when I look at myself, my dream is becoming a reality. I can give back, and I volunteer in my community. That breaks my isolation. As the days get short, people call me all the time, would you speak at my school? I don't get paid for 90% of the schools that I speak at, but if I can change the life and the mind of one child that has how he or she thinks about somebody else, my dream will become a reality. Volunteering, giving back, you can start with yourself. Yes, a lot of people with intellectual disability are told what they can't do, but if you have your persons and you get out there and show them and put them in the community, people get to know you. And that's a good feeling. And that breaks down the isolation and that breaks down the depression and what it causes. I know this whole session was based on isolation and stigma and poverty, but everyone has something to give. And when you're able to give to your community, starting with yourself, or to show somebody else as a child or a person with intellectual disability that they are valued, then your dream becomes a reality. Thank you.